Okay, this is chapter 17b. It's from the book Medical Reformation. And the topic today, we're continuing with neurophysiology and excitotoxins, but we're going to have a little bit of a sidetrack today. We're going to talk about psychiatry. Um, because psychiatry, a lot of the medicines in psychiatry are excitotoxins or the toxic to brain cells in other ways. Um, psychiatry is one of the worst fields in medicine. Um, it's, it's, <clears throat> its drugs are really illegitimate, almost all of them, and they really should not be used. And Peter Gotsky, like a real world famous uh, researcher from the Cochrane collaboration, he basically said it would be better off if there were no psychiatric drugs because they cause far more damage than they do benefit. Okay, um, here is an action potential. We already talked about this, but just to briefly refresh your memory because it's going to come up. You'll have activation of the neuron. Here's the nucleus in the cell body, this region where the nucleus is located. An action potential is fired at the axon hillock. Uh, sodium channels propagate the action potential down the axon. It reaches the synaptic terminal, axon terminal, and now the depolarization, increase in charge, opens up the voltage-gated calcium channels. You need to know that, voltage-gated calcium channels. When the voltage-gated calcium channels are open, they will cause the neurotransmitter vesicles to travel to the plasma membrane at the synaptic cleft, and then the plasma membrane uh, will merge with the vesicles such that the neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft. They diffuse across it, and then they interact with a receptor on the postsynaptic neuron, and they will exert an effect. Okay, so that's neurotransmission. And then we'll talk about what the drugs do. Okay, so here's an example of what the drugs do. Okay, this is a serotonin synapse. So here's a, the vesicle of neurotransmitter with serotonin and it. It'll merge with the plasma membrane, then the serotonin uh, individual molecules will be released in the synaptic cleft. They'll diffuse across the synaptic cleft. They will bind to a serotonin receptor and that will then exert an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. This is the presynaptic neuron. Okay, so what do the drugs do? Well, a typical drug is something called an SSRI, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. So these are the serotonin reuptake transporters and this drug will block them. Okay, a classic drug that's a SSRI would be something like Prozac, fluoxetine, okay? Now, what that's going to do, of course, if you block the reuptake, so you're blocking this part right here, now you're going to get an accumulation of more neurotransmitter within the synaptic cleft. And so that might increase the effect of serotonin. But here's the catch. The brain, as Dr. Bragan says, greatest psychiatrist who ever lived, he says the brain's going to fight the drug. It will sense that something's abnormal, and it will produce more of these serotonin reuptake transporters. So it's going to compensate for the effect of the drug. In addition, the postsynaptic membrane, it might downregulate, you know, stop expressing its um, serotonin receptors, so many of them, on its uh, membrane at the synaptic cleft. So it's going to make compensatory adaptations. And I think this is very dangerous because you're changing the brain in an unpredictable way. And a lot of very bad things have happened from psychiatric medicines. If you look at, you know, violent behavior and a lot of other craziness happening, um, a lot of it comes from these drugs, these SSRI drugs. And they're not only toxic to brain cells, they're also toxic to mitochondria quite often. Uh, inhibiting the electron transport chain on the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that is bad because if you decrease electron transport in the inner mitochondrial membrane, then you're going to make less ATP. Then you're going to be less able to pump out calcium. So you've got an excitotoxin effect. Anything that diminishes your ability to lower cytoplasm calcium has an excitotoxin effect. Okay, and also I'm going to say that, you know, my father was a psychiatrist, and my father was a good man. <clears throat> he, you know, did as best he could to help his patients. I know he really liked his patients. Um, he actually saw a lot of patients in the house. Uh, our old house was in an area where you were allowed to have a doctor's office inside your home. So all these patients would come to our house. When I was a kid, we weren't allowed to answer the door because it might be somebody that we know. A lot of doctor families would send themselves or their kids to our house to see my father so we weren't allowed to answer the door for that reason. And, uh, but I make the point that that's how it was. It was a pretty social thing. And, you know, my parents played tennis at the tennis club. And so they knew a lot of people. And, um, that was, and my dad was a well-respected guy. He was the chief of two departments. 
Um, and so, and he, and he made a lot of money. Back then in the 19, you know, 70s and 80s, doctors made about three times as much money as they make now. <clears throat> so that was all good. And, you know, I really looked up to my father when I was growing up, and I think that's a beneficial thing. You know, he was a boxing champion as an athlete, and he was, you know, a doctor and all this stuff. And so I sort of looked at my dad as a is my role model of a student athlete, you know, and kind of a boxer was a tough guy. I was a wrestler, kind of a tough guy, if you will. And then, you know, the medicine's a scholarly thing. And so I always wanted to imitate my father. And I, I was good because he would work all day, take the dog for a walk, and then he would sit in bed and read and listen to classical music. That's what he did every day in, in the Irish music, okay? So I did pretty much the same thing, you know, and then my uncle would come over on the weekends and holidays and they would argue about books. So I got in the habit of reading books and arguing with my uncle. I, I just say all these things because I want to make the point. My father really meant well and did the best he could. But I'm also going to say something. Why don't more doctors complain or refuse to practice by the standard of care when they know it's stupid? And I would say a lot of doctors, they don't even realize it's stupid. They don't know anything about nutrition, epidemiology, or toxicology. All they know is that all their journals say prescribe this drug. They get paid to prescribe this drug. Uh, the guidelines require them to prescribe that drug or they could be sued for malpractice for not following the standard of care. So then why is the standard of care so bad? You know, they say the standard of care is really the standard of don't care, okay, or doesn't care. And I'm kind of joking about that, but the point I'm saying is what happens is in these big name medical centers, like all the Ivy League places, for example, Big Pharma controls the journals, controls the scientists, controls the doctors, and you basically have to do what Big Pharma says or you don't get any grant money and if you really criticize big pharma a lot they'll come after you and try to get you fired and make your life miserable so medicine's controlled by big pharma it's not controlled by doctors okay and a lot of people say that and i actually think that's a common reason why so many basic institutions in the united states have been severely damaged or, or just outright ruined look at the public schools lots of teachers they really love the kids. They want to help the kids. They do the best they can. But the people who run the public school system, they hate the children. Okay, it's insane. You know, a boy goes to school and somebody tries to get him to say, would you like to be a girl? And then they castrate the kid if he says yes. That's insane. I mean, it's completely insane. There's nothing reasonable about it. It's insane. Okay, and they drug children with amphetamines. It's insane. That's child psychiatry. We're not really talking about child psychiatry, but it's kind of the same thing. As Thomas Shaz used to say, he's a real famous psychiatrist, he said, giving psychiatric medicines to children is poisoning children. Okay, and we should be open and honest about these things. If we were open and honest about them, it wouldn't happen. But the fact that we try to pretend that their heart's in the right place, the people who run psychiatry, who run medicine, leads to all kinds of terrible um, things happening to patients. And it goes back to the Voltaire quote, if you can make the people believe absurdities, you can get them to commit atrocities. And I would say psychiatric practice as it is today is an atrocity against the patient. Okay, and that's based on a lot of knowledge of psychiatry. I lived it around my father all those years. I considered going into psychiatry. So I know a lot about psychiatry and I can tell you it's a, it's a joke. And now don't wrong, I know some pretty good guys, but how could a good person be a psychiatrist? And I'll tell you how it is. Because this will sound mean, but it's true. They're not that bright, okay? <laughs> you know, when you start studying neurophysiology, you start realizing the complexity of a synapse. There's a lot of interacting neurotransmitters. It's not always just one synapse, one neurotransmitter. It's more like this interactive process between a bunch of neurons, and it's rather like a symphony. And you really, you know, you're throwing a monkey wrench in there with these SSRI drugs, and the consequences are often very bad, okay? And then you also get synaptic adjustments, and it makes it harder for the person ever to get better again. So this guy, Dr. Bragan, he's a Harvard psychiatrist. He's the greatest psychiatrist that ever lived, you know, from my extensive experience with the subject. Um, and he actually said something interesting. He said that basically if you want to really help patients, you have to kind of love the patient. And what he meant by that is you have to really pursue what is in their best interest regardless of all the standard of care and all the pressures on you. There's always a pressure on a doctor. Go faster, go faster, generate your billing codes. There's always some bean counter, every hospital, every clinic who cracks a whip and says, do your damn job, generate more billing codes, or we're going to have to let you go. So all doctors are under that pressure. Patients tend to think that their doctor is autonomous. Yes, that's my doctor. My doctor is trying to help me with my problem. They don't understand. 
Your doctor probably doesn't care about you very much because you are kind of irrelevant. And by that I mean to get money, they have to make the insurance company ha you know, happy. Okay, if you want to do, if you want to, <clears throat> you also don't want to piss off Big Pharma, but most doctors don't really have any direct involvement with Big Pharma. They have involvement with their boss who wants them generating money, billing codes, and they have to please Big Pharma, which means follow the standard of care. And, and sorry, the insurance companies. The insurance companies promote all this drug dealing. If the insurance companies really wanted to help the patient, why don't they promote, you know, vegan diet and all this other stuff? They don't, okay? So here's another example of how it's kind of like a symphony. There's all these different neurotransmitters involved and different synapses and inputs. So it's very symphony-like and it's complex. Uh, the vast majority of neurotransmitters in the brain, over 90%, are glutamate, which is excitatory. It means it increases the activity in the postsynaptic neuron. Um, then there's probably in the ballpark of 5% of GABA. It depends what part of the brain you're talking about, but GABA um, is like the off switch. It turns things off. So uh, this would be GABA, turning this light off, okay? That's GABA, okay? And here's glutamate, turning things on, all right? Um, so basically, it's rather complex. And then you talk, everybody always hears about the other neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, but those are all small. All of them in the ballpark are 1%, okay? So they're really minor modulators in comparison with, you know, glutamate's the big, big, big thing really in the brain. Okay, so what am I saying about psychiatry? Look, I'm just going to tell you like it is, okay? So like I said, my father really met well, did the best he could for his patients. But I can remember he was so excited about Prozac. Everybody was. You know, my dad would get free samples of Prozac, and my mom was at the tennis club. And if my mom's friends said they were feeling depressed, she would give them free samples. She's like, oh, my friend, she was kind of depressed for a while, but I gave her some free samples. She's doing so much better now. I'm like, mom, she was, my mom wasn't a doctor, okay? That's just the craziness of it. You know, it kind of reminded me of the stock market, you know, about 20, 30 years ago when it was described as a rational exuberance. That's what it was like with the um, SSRIs. Everybody sort of thought the previous tricyclic antidepressants had too many side effects, but now with the SSRIs, they would have better results and fewer side effects. But it turned out they got a lot more disasters at schools and other places with these SSRIs. Okay, and what Bregan talks about and other ones, it's not just Bregan, there's a whole bunch of psychiatrists who are wise to this now. Basically, psychiatric drugs <clears throat> tend to create the effect of a slowly progressive chemical lobotomy, okay? Uh, they damage the brain, you know, and then they sometimes will treat psychiatric disorders that are severe and refractory with surgical lobotomies. Uh, refractory depression, for example, is you know often treated with electrical lobotomies, electroshock therapy, which I think is insane, just running random electricity through a person's brain. Now, don't get me wrong, I asked my father about that, <clears throat> and he told me some of these patients are just so sick and nothing works, and they're very, very high risk for suicide, so he says it seems to help, and he actually thought it was worth doing. All right, but, you know, I joke, here's a patient going to the front desk in a psychiatric department, and they're like, yeah, you can have your choice. Chemical lobotomy, surgical lobotomy, electrical lobotomy. I would say run for your life. You'll never hear psychiatrists talk about food and mood or toxins and mood and all that stuff. And, you know, they certainly are not allowed to talk about religion and conventional medicine. But those are really key things for making yourself happy, having a sense of purpose, developing your social skills optimizing your diet, avoiding brain toxins, all of that will have a great effect on improving mood. Food and mood are two very related things. I also noticed that people said to me, I kind of mellowed out when I became a vegetarian. I was a pretty gung-ho, real competitive guy. And um, I was told, you know, by my family, you just mellowed out when you became a vegetarian. I still was internally mentally competitive at trying to achieve whatever my goals were but I just didn't let things bother me a lot of that was I was getting older and I had done a lot more reading and thinking and I kind of realized the world's just the way it is and now when you're young you want to change the world you want to change everybody you know like I had come from Harvard for my fellowship and I expected every other place I went to be like Harvard and uh, but the thing that's unique about Harvard is there's lots of people around there's all kinds of people who want to be there and there's just like extra ancillary personnel pretty much in all kinds of areas. So there's a lot more people to do work. You go to some other place, there's no one there except yourself and a few people paid and they don't want any extra uh, labor, if you will. But so basically what am I trying to say is my dad meant well, he did the best he could, but the big name medical centers 
all wrote into the guidelines a bunch of stupid stuff that wasn't true. And, you know, my father was smart enough to learn what he had to learn, but he wasn't smart enough to see that most of what he was taught in his journals and stuff was not true. And he wasn't smart enough to figure that out. When I got older, like I always wanted to challenge my dad because my dad used to piss me off. He would kind of criticize me. Uh, after I got injured, I was still good at wrestling, but I was no longer good. I used to take first place in tournaments. Then I would start taking third or fifth or something, you know, in the big college tournaments. Division one, you know, I, I set the all-time school record for wins in a season at Stanford University. But I no longer was like I used to be. And my dad would all say, well, why didn't you win the tournament, you know? Or I know you beat that guy before. How could you lose to that guy in the tournament? And so... I, and then I wanted the red shirt. It means take an extra year to kind of improve your, your skill as a wrestler, as an athlete. And my dad was always like, no, 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 you need to finish school and get on to medical school. And at that age, you know, I, and back in those days, you didn't really argue with your father too much. So I was like, okay, dad, but I really wish I could do this. Nowadays, now with my personal mind, now how I am now, I'd say, no, dad, I'm taking a red shirt year and I'll have a better year next year. I should be an All-American. I want that extra year. So anyways, there was some resentment between me and my father. And I kind of look forward to someday being as smart and knowledgeable as him. And then I could argue with him and win arguments. And what I found was, you know, basically once I sort of finished all my training, and I had more time to go at home and, you know, at the family parties when all the doctors were over there. I was just so much far ahead of them from being through such intense academic situations that, you know, he really couldn't argue with me at all. Uh, I actually felt sorry for him, you know. He might have had some head trauma when he was younger as a boxer. But like I said, he was a good guy. In my whole life, he never lied to me once. And I know he did the best for his patients. Lots of his patients, they're all family friends. We had lots of people come into our house all the time. And we even knew them. And sometimes when the patients were sick, their children would be like adopted by us. That's not a joke. Their children would live with us for months or years. Okay, um, getting back to psychiatry. Here's a book by um, this lady here, Kelly Brogan. Let me, get, let me get right up to the book here. And it's a good book. I like her. She's nice. She's smart. She's a half Irish, half Italian lady. Real pretty. She's, um, you know, went to MIT. She's real smart. And she was one of the first to come out and say, look, these drugs are BS. They're just hurting the patients. We should not be going down this path. And she basically said she never saw a single patient cured by them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so anyway, she's good. She's got online videos and stuff. Um, and I think she had a lot of guts to, to, to come tell people the truth before it was popular to do so. And she caught some flack for doing that. When a doctor comes out and does the right thing and stands by the patients, they don't get celebrated for it. They get hassled for it. Okay, um, now here's sort of the, the best book, I think, on psychiatric drugs. If you're only going to, if you're real serious about trying to understand neuropsychiatric pharmacology, this is the best book. And it's by Peter Bragan. He's the Harvard psychiatrist. I think he's the best, greatest psychiatrist who ever lived based on what I've seen so far. And the name of the book is Brain Disabling Treatments in Psychiatry. And he basically goes how drugs and electroshock cause a lobotomy. They cause a slowly progressive, you know, chemical lobotomy in this case, electrical lobotomy in this case. And he goes through it as much scientific detail as you could want. Um, this is the big book, okay? So if you really want to understand something, that's the book you go to. He wrote a bunch of other books. He's got online videos. You know, he's real nice. And, you know, you basically, like I said, you have to put the patient above the money or otherwise bad things happen in medicine. And so all these people, like sometimes when I give lectures, I'll get some people say, oh, drop this religious crap. You know, you shouldn't talk about religion. You're going to alienate people. And you know what I say? You guys don't understand. Okay, I live in medicine. I, I grew up around medicine. My father's a doctor. Tons of my relatives are doctors. Um, I have been around medicine all my life in, in, and in every environment you can imagine, in community hospitals, in uh, county hospitals, in Ivy League hospitals, and I can tell you, religion's like the most important thing because religion tells you that man's created in the image of God to love the patient and do what's right without the money involved. And I can tell you, modern medicine, it totally runs on money. It runs on money, and it's even worse than that. The, the people, the higher up you go in the medical hierarchy, the medical pyramid, the more they hate the patient. They just have contempt for them. They're like, you know, like I said, would you poison a child? A normal person would not poison a child, even if they hated the kid, hated the family, hated the country, everything you could think of. They would not do that to a child. They just ethically would not do that. Medicine does it all day long every day, okay? That's what I mean by big pharma hates the children. And the people high up, high up, there's a lot of pressure on them to make money, okay? Let's say you run a hospital. You've got to make money or you will be fired, 
okay? And it doesn't matter what happens to the patient. Nobody cares if all the patients die. As long as the hospital makes money, that person will have a job. There'll be a new chump to come along tomorrow. So that's why, you know, like I said, they'll give drugs to patients where anybody with a brain who's done the research will know this is a bad idea, okay? Here's another book, Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. And he just wrote, you know, all about what a disaster psychiatric drugs are and how damaging, for example, these attention deficit medicines are, giving amphetamines to children. It's insane. You, can, you can't sell an amphetamine on a street corner to an adult, but you're supposed to give it to a child? It's crazy. Okay. Lifelong amphetamines, you know, these toxic hyperstimulant drugs. You want to talk about excitotoxins, okay? Now, here's a good book. Um, this guy is James Davies. And he has a really good online lecture. Um, I linked to it earlier. I had I had all, I had videos about all these books and links to them later in my earlier videos. This is just now. Again, I'm reading from my my current book, but his lecture on psychiatry and how the DSM was written is great. And what you basically realize the DSM was just a couple of psychiatrists who got together and decided, you know, how can we standardize all the drug treatments in psychiatry and make it more drug based? Psychiatrists really like drugs because that's the main thing that distinguishes them from psychologists. So they're very heavy on the drugs. It also distinguishes them from the psychoanalysts. And psychoanalysis was the biggest crock of BS, okay? And Freud's another guy who hated the patients, okay? Read about Freud. I've read several books about Freud, okay? He hated the patients. He had contempt for the patients, okay? And so when you see that, that's another thing too. Regular people often can't understand things because their fundamental assumptions are wrong. When you start thinking, you know, in a different way, and it's not a pleasant way to think, but when you start thinking that the people higher up in medicine, they look at you as a useless eater, a waste of space, just an animal that pollutes the world. They don't care about you at all. When you understand that, you'll be smarter because you'll say, is it really in my best interest to have this treatment or to take this drug? What should I do? You should not assume the psychiatrist knows what they're talking about. You should not assume the drug will really help you, okay? Um, and so he just makes the point. The whole DSM, it wasn't really based on science. It was just on agreements based on a bunch of doctors on how to standardize the drug treatments, okay? It's a joke, okay? And you need to, to know that, okay? And they keep on making up new diagnoses so they can prescribe more drugs. And you say, well, why would anybody do that? Because they can make millions and millions of dollars doing this, you don't make money helping people. You make money tricking chumps into taking your drugs or your surgeries, okay? I strongly recommend you watch the James Davies videos online. Again, I made more detailed videos about all these books and these psychiatrists. Okay, now we're going to talk about Tommy Shadows. And by the way, like, I don't get any money from doing this, but I want to do it. It makes me feel like, you know, I did something useful. I spent, you know, decades of my young life studying in libraries, working in hospitals. And um, like I, when I was in college, I always had this idea, well, someday my life will be fun like it was in high school and everything will be a lot of fun again. And I'll just have to, you know, pay my dues for a couple years here being like an intense academic guy. <laughs> and it's almost like God told me ever since I was eight, up until I was 18, I had the best life. You'd be totally jealous of me. I was runner up for King of Hearts at my high school, homecoming king. And, um, I had the greatest life you can imagine. I was a great athlete. I had the most wonderful girl. I went out there like nine years. She was like a dream, okay? And then after that, I'm alone at Stanford and then pretty much alone through most of the rest of my time. And I was like, I learned about intense loneliness and just being a workaholic, nonstop work. So what I'm trying to say is, it's almost like God said, from the rest of your life, you're going to be a scholar. I didn't really plan it this way. It just happened. And my parents, you know, were both good to me and loved me, but they're sort of like fuzzy little foreigners. They don't really know America or how to navigate a life. They just had to survive their poverty when they were young. Okay, so anyways, here's men, the myth. So what I'm trying to say is I do all this because it's the right thing to do, okay? And I know that I'm doing the right thing. But the people that are smart enough to understand, they'll see that between the lines, I'm doing the right thing in a big way, even though there's no money in all this, okay? And I'm actually probably pissing off some people, but my other friend told me, no, nah, you don't really piss people off too much because no one's ever heard of you. So, <laughs> uh, so anyways, that was kind of funny. All right, so here's the myth of mental illness by Thomas Schatz. Um, it explains how psychiatric labels people with insulting names, and it's like labeling a package as garbage. Okay, the myth of mental illness. He wrote a couple other books too. He has some online videos as well. All these people I've talked about so far, James Davies, uh, Peter Bragan, Thomas Schatz, um, and Kelly Brogan, they've all they've all got online videos, so you can watch their videos. Maybe I'll, I'll 
try linking to some of them. Okay, I'm just going to read some quotes by Thomas Shaz. He's very clever. Uh, here we go. He says, a mental hospital is a cemetery for the living dead. The dormitory beds are the grave sites. The psychiatric diagnosis is the gravestone. The psychiatrist is the grave digger. And the patient is the corpse. <laughs> That's what he thinks of mental hospitals. Okay, Thomas Shouse continues. In the animal kingdom, the rule is to eat or be eaten. In the human kingdom, it is to define or be defined. He who defines dominates. Okay, now that's kind of getting into a sidetrack there, but if you see that in politics and current events, basically you can make a definition and it can basically destroy an entire group of people. The way things are currently defined right now, the goal is to destroy um, certain populations. You know, it, I, I'm not going to get into this now because this talk is about psychiatry and, and medical stuff, but. Remember that quote because it comes up all the time in, in current events thinking. In the animal kingdom, the rule is eat or be eaten. In the human kingdom, it is defined or be defined. He who defines dominates. All right, so who can control how people think will control probably the outcome of a situation. Okay, here's a good Thomas Quas quote, Thomas Shaw's quote. Psychotherapy is medicalization of human social problems through and through, 100%. Psychoanalysis is medicalization squared. It's much worse. You know, trying to make a person constantly blaming everybody in their childhood for all their problems, forever displacing the blame onto others rather than saying, okay, I had some problems, but now I'm moving on and getting better. Um, it's a disaster psychoanalysis. It actually destroys people. Um, and that's, like I said, Freud, Freud and Freudian therapy is an absolute joke. Okay, psychiatry is medicalization cubed. Yep, there's a great, great metaphor there. First of all, psychology, I made a whole bunch of videos about this, but the more I studied psychology, the more I came to the conclusion it's a big joke for the most part. What's good about psychology is they did some good research studies back in the old days. And uh, psychiatrists, you know, they tend to be pretty nice. I know a lot of psychiatrists, and most of them are pretty nice, and they do try to do the best they can in their context for the patient. They'll evaluate them, try to figure out, is the person demented? Are they suicidal? All of that is good and reasonable, okay? But they do have a tendency to be, again, like a conveyor belt, pushing the patients to psychiatrists to hook them on drugs. And the other thing I don't like about psychology, psychology has become part of the establishment, okay? And you gotta remember, you know, what does the establishment want? The establishment wants to decrease the size of the population. So they're part of that system. And what I mean by that is whatever BS comes along, they go with it, okay? So, you know, now they're told, oh, you're supposed to have new pronouns. Oh, okay, I'll take these pronouns. They'll go with any of that. The whole purpose of that is to get rid of Christianity, okay? That's what that's all about, to eradicate the standard family, to eradicate the religion of Christianity, which says all men are equal before the eyes of God. That's what that's all about, okay? It's not about helping people. And the other thing is, how could a psychologist help you with a relationship if they can't tell you the difference between a man and a woman, okay? I mean, it's so ridiculous, it's not even funny. If you don't know the difference between a man and a woman, how are you going to give advice to people about male-female relationships, which are most relationships that people go to psychologists about, okay? Um, the other thing, too, is I've had some friends who went through divorce, and every single one of them told me a psychologist pushed and pushed and pushed to cause a divorce and to rip off the family, okay? You know, I had male doctor friends who lost all their life savings, lost their kids' uh, college tuition funds. They lost the family home, all of this stuff. Uh, because of the it's like it's been called divorce incorporated, the way the divorce system is designed to bankrupt the family, and to really sell the man into slavery, and psychologists really push that big time, okay, and they think oh it's so great to break up the family oh the father was so bad, well you know what children grow up poorly without fathers, I've seen people who you know had a lot of potential when they were young and just one disaster after another I know like one guy was a young genius guy. Parents got divorced and, you know, the kid dropped out of school and took him a couple of years to get his life back on track. I know another kid, similar sort of situation. He was really smart, all the AP classes in high school. You know, his parents used to joke with, you know, my wife and I, oh, he's going to be smarter than me and all this type of stuff. And it just ruined the kid. I mean, when the parents got divorced, the kid, you know, dropped out of school, became an alcoholic. He had all kinds of problems. It was a disaster. 
Um, and I've seen other similar situations to that. Plus what I've seen with boys, if they grow up around women, the women spoil them. Oh, I love you. You're so wonderful. You're so good. And they sort of become detached a little bit from reality. They have an inflated sense of themselves relative to reality. And they also tend to often become kind of impulsive. You know, whereas with, when, you're with, when you're with your father, man, you're, you piss off your father, I'll kick your ass. And you, you, you're kind of reminded, no one in this world cares about you. You need to be a hard worker. Whereas with your mommies, I was like, oh, you deserve to be paid more. You're so wonderful. And don't get me wrong. You need the love of your mother. Super important, especially when you're young. But you also need the father as a role model. Um, you know, that was good. Every day my father got up early in the morning and worked all day long. Um, and so that was built into me. I just had expectation. When I get older, I'll work all day long <clears throat> and I'll have a nice, big, happy family. I'll be just like my dad, like my dad and my mom. That was built into me. Um, there, was, there, was, there, was never, there was never questioned ever. It was obvious. My parents were super happy and we had a really happy uh, childhood and family home. And that was largely because my mother, my dad was working all the time, but he was a role model for being a worker. My mom was a role model for uh, having a happy family. And they both did great jobs as, you know, as far as they could. Um, let's see. Tommy Shaz continues. The less, oh, and one last thing I'll say about psychology is after an extensive study of psychology and an extensive study of, psych of uh, Christianity, the psychology of Christianity is much better than the psychology of psychology. And I've, I've talked about this before, but just to make a long story short, if you ask a psychologist what's a good book, they're going to be hesitant to say anything, whereas Christianity can very quickly tell you. Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, Les Miserables, Victor Hugo, uh, Quo Vadis, uh, Henry Sienkiewicz, Brothers Karamazov by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky. He can tell you good books. What's good art? Michelangelo, Raphael, Caravaggio, uh, John Everett Millay, all of them. Carl Bloke. They'll tell you all this stuff. It's real easy for them to tell you what good art is. They'll tell you, um, you know, what is a family, you know, a husband and a wife married, okay? They will tell you all this stuff and they've got their opinion on all that. And it's been that way for thousands of years. How are you supposed to behave? There's the Ten Commandments. There's what Jesus said. Be nice to each other. Treat others as you would want to be treated in their situation. All of that stuff it all, it all, it's all there. You can ask them what's good architecture. They'll say a cathedral. Um, so they, you know, what's an example of how to behave? Who are good role models? They'll say read about the saints. Okay, and, and that works surprisingly well. You'd be amazed how well that works. Um, you don't have to live all the way like them. Some of the saints obviously took it too far from what you're willing to do, but they're still good role models in a lot of ways. And Jesus Christu, be like Jesus Christu, okay? Well, that's the whole Thomas Ignatius in the original Jesuits, what they were all about, imitation of Christ. Imitatio Christu. Okay, Thomas Shaz continues. The less a person knows about the workings of the social institutions of society, the more he must trust those who wield power in it. And the more he trusts those who wield power, the more vulnerable he makes himself to becoming their victim. And that's what I've seen too. A lot of these patients, they show up to these modern hospitals and they're like country bumpkins. They're like, oh my goodness, wow, isn't this a beautiful building? Oh, wow, what an impressive machine, you know, the CAT scanner or the MRI machine. Wow, medicine has really progressed a lot since when I was young. And whenever I hear them talk like that, I think to myself, this poor chump, this poor, this poor dummy, okay? Because they, they kind of go in there thinking, oh, all these nice people here to help me. And don't get me wrong, like I said, People go into medicine wanting to help the patient. They really do. Uh, but they then get forced by the designers of the system are like big pharma and insurance companies. And their attitude is, how can we get as much money out of this person? Okay, it's not, they're not interested in helping the patient. Okay, I, I've been a doctor a long time and I can assure you, it's, it's rather shocking. It's been one of my frustrations as a doctor is that if you really try to help the patient and, and you start breaking away from the standard of care, when it's obvious that that's the right thing to do, you don't get congratulated, you get in trouble. They'll come after you and mess with you. So think about that. If a doctor actually has a higher cure rate, they will get in trouble, okay? <clears throat> if they have tons and tons of bad outcomes, but they follow the standard of care, no one cares. Um, actually, I'll tell you one other situation. When I was an uh, intern, I did a surgical internship. It was a transitional surgical internship. <clears throat> and um, there was this one doctor at the hospital who was notorious for really being pretty mediocre. All the residents hated him. The residents said they were, many residents wrote letters of protest saying they did not want to work with this doctor. He was an internal medicine subspecialty. And uh, they said he neglects his patient. He's a crappy doctor. He doesn't know what he's doing. 
And then I noticed that this guy was like one of the most popular doctors in the hospital with the hospital management. Again, this was back when I was in the first year of my internship as a resident. And um, I didn't understand it at first, but then I found out what happened. So this guy as an internist would very quickly see a patient and he would just write a bunch of consults. See ortho for this, see uh, you know endocrine for this, see cardiology for this, and then he would disappear and not really spend hardly any more time with that patient. So how could this guy be so popular? Why did the other doctors of the hospital love the guy in a private practice hospital and why did the residents hate him? So the other doctors loved him because he sent them tons of business. He was constantly sending referrals for all the consults. Instead of trying to figure out anything by himself, he sent all these patients to consults. So he was generating tons of money for the other doctors and for the hospital. But the residents who had to rotate with him, they hated him because he didn't know anything, he couldn't teach them anything useful, and they felt he was irresponsible. Um, so that kind of tells you something, okay? Because you know the residents, when they're still young and naive and wanting to do the right thing, they thought the guy was terrible. Uh, but, okay, see how that works. Okay, now here's Thomas Shaz. Those who suffer from and complain of their own behavior are usually classified as neurotic. Those whose behavior affects others and makes them complain are usually classified as psychotic. Thomas Shaz continues. In the past, men created witches. Now they create mental patients. Psychiatry belongs in the same category as astrology. It's a pseudoscience. Saying a patient has a mental illness is similar to saying that they are possessed by the devil. <laughs> okay, Shaz continues. Giving children medications for psychiatric conditions is not treatment. It is poisoning. Okay, he's got the balls to tell the truth. And so that's a big thing, I think, in medicine about being smart. A lot of it is having courage, having courage to contradict the standard of care. That takes a lot of effort because people say, oh, doctors are so smart. No, they're not. What doctors have going for them is they tend to be relatively well organized with their time management. They're good at memorizing large amounts of material so they can get through you know, pre-med, med school, residency. They're hard workers. You can't, be, you can't be a doctor and not be a hard worker because, again, like I said, there's going to always be some bean counter cracking a whip saying, you're supposed to generate more billing codes. Go, go, go. Uh, so they have to crank them out or they'll be fired or everyone will be pissed off at them. Like, let's say, you know, the clinic has to see 100 patients that day. Well, if, if the other two guys are seeing 40 apiece and then the one guy's only seeing 20, they're going to be pissed off at him in a big way because they got to do more work. And, you know, maybe if they get paid per patient, then maybe it's different. But a lot of times they're on a salary. So if they're all getting the same amount of pay and the other guy's only seeing 20, you say, well, then he's lazy. He's only doing half as much work. But maybe he's actually empowering the patients by talking to them. It would depend on the situation. But you, you see my point. What happens to the patient is irrelevant. That's an important thing for patients to understand because patients think, I'm going to go to the doctor and he's going to help cure me. And what I'm trying to tell you is it's not in the doctor's interest to cure you for a chronic disease. They would lose money. They make more money by keeping you on pills and keeping you sick. Okay, so the patient's interests are not the same as the doctors, the insurance companies, or the drug companies. They make more money if you are constantly sick the rest of your life taking pills. Okay, um, Thomas Shiles, oh, let, me, let me run this thing a little bit further up. Thomas Shaw says, as the base rhetorician uses language to increase his own power, to produce converts to his own cause, and to create loyal followers of his own person, so the noble rhetorician uses language to wean men away from their inclination to depend on authority, to encourage them to think and to speak clearly and to teach them to be their own masters. Okay, so that's good. And basically, one of the ways you can get a sense of how medicine works is just go on the internet and look at the nutrition you know, doctors, okay? And you'll see nine out of 10 are lying to you, uh, like in a major way. They're talking about recommending paleo, keto, carnivore, Mediterranean, low carb, all that nonsense. Okay, and then even of the ones that are gonna recommend a vegan diet, it's, a, it's more than half of them are BSing you, and you can tell they're BSing you. The way you can tell somebody's BSing you is when there's a contraindication. If they sit there and tell you, oh, sleep is so important, you got to get your sleep, and then they tell you, oh, caffeine is good for you, how could something that in, in significantly impairs your sleep be good for you? That's obviously BS, okay? And then as you learn, higher dietary fat causes obesity, increases your risk of diabetes, uh, increases your risk of cancer, increases uh, your, your weight gain, and then somebody's going to tell you all these high-fat foods are good, it's obvious that they're BSing you. But I've noticed that a lot of the most popular doctors are ones who do what I would call like something like 
80-20 or 70-30. They'll tell you 70% good information. So they gain your trust and now you believe them. And then 30%, they just bullshit you. They even, they even tell you to do things that I think are almost suicidal. And, and people think they're great. Okay, a lot of the doctors who talk that way, they are really famous. Okay, super famous, thousand times more famous than I am. Okay, and it amazes me, but it's like obviously stupid the stuff they say. It's just completely obviously stupid. Um, and then the other thing too is, you know, you got to go back to the papers before 1980 for a lot of topics. Okay, because if you look at papers on soy written in the last 10 years, you'll think soy is a miracle drug. But you go back to the original papers, and it's obviously a, a bad thing. Okay. All right. So let's continue with Thomas Shaw's. He says, self-respect is to the soul as oxygen is to the body. Deprive a person of oxygen and you kill his body. Deprive him of self-respect and you kill his spirit. Okay, so he's pretty perceptive there. What you do is put a person in a situation where they can improve gradually over time and build their confidence. You don't want to lie to a person. Uh, I've seen people lie to kids and it's had a bad effect on them. When they lie to kids about where they're at, the kid has to accept where they're at in, comp in competition for whatever it might be. Okay, if you lie to them, you, you, then you confuse their ability to calibrate things correctly. Okay, um, as the internal combustion engine runs on gasoline, so the person runs on self-esteem. If he is full of it, he is good for the long run. If he is partly filled, he will soon need to be refueled. And if he is empty, he will come to a stop. Thomas Shiles continues. Traditionally, men used power to gain sex, and women used sex to gain power. There's some truth in that, you know, in the sense that the man has to generate some status uh, or be tall or be really good looking to attract a woman. And the woman, if she's just good looking, she can attract a man. She doesn't have to do anything. You know, there was a lady named Esther Villar who wrote a really funny book called The Manipulated Man. She said if a woman's attractive, she doesn't need to be any more articulate or knowledgeable than a chimpanzee and she'll be able to attract a man. Okay, uh, versus for men, it's harder. They have to compete with each other, so to speak, to be able to attract a woman. Um, and just in general, men like women way more than women like men. You know, we talked about this in one of my videos before. If you go to these dating sites, the men will say 85% of the women are attractive. The women will say only the opposite, only 15% of the men are attractive. Um, people often say, okay, Thomas Shaw's, that this or that person has not found themselves. But a self is not something one finds. A self is something that one creates. Okay. And then here he is, you know, this guy has so many good quotes. Clear thinking requires courage rather than intelligence. And that's true, especially in medicine, because the more you tell the truth to the public, the more trouble you get into, the more people who are pissed off at you. Okay, like I said, the higher you go up in medicine, the more they hate the patients. They really hate them, okay? And they would prefer that they would be gone even. It's bizarre. You would think that they would want you know, the patient to live longer and just keep getting drug money from them, but they really hate the patient. It's almost unimaginable how much they hate the patient. So what I'm trying to say is, if you just keep your mouth shut as a doctor, crank out your billing codes, everybody's happy with you. No one really gives a rat's ass. Just get your money for the day um, and go home. That's what is expected and desired in a doctor by establishments in all Western society. Uh, so that's why somebody like, you know, McDougal or myself, we're very unusual. Um, and it's not just IQ, it's a personality thing because it's, it, there's no reward for contradicting the standard of care, the standard of don't care. You just have to believe it's the right thing and you want to do the right thing. Okay. Um, Thomas Shiles continues, Young and Adler were an improvement on Freud, but they did not go far enough. The key is meaning. Meaning is what sets people free. And I would agree that to that to a large extent, you know, and that also sort of has echoes, you know, reminders, one of like Viktor Frankl and other people. So basically, you know, Fyodor Dostoevsky said, you know, if a man has a purpose, Schopenhauer said the same thing too, if a man has a purpose, like I must do this, and you see it in a woman too, you can see a woman, you know, let's say a woman's priority typically is to do what's best for her children. 
And when, when she's doing what's best for her kids, a woman will do like almost anything to help her kids. And so, but that determination to help one's children, or if it's for yourself because you're trying to achieve a goal, you'll be able to endure tons and tons of stuff that would be otherwise hard to endure. And that's also why I think atheists tend to be weak. Because if you think everything is meaningless, then what's the point of doing anything other than for short-term goals? To make a little money, you know, to get laid. Uh, versus when you have some like sense of a higher calling, it'll push you um, to, to work hard. You know, and, I, and that's why I think it's important to have a philosophic sense of what you want to achieve, what's important to you. Because you got to spend about one-third of your life asleep in bed. Then you spend about one-third of your life doing some job for money. And if you're lucky, you'll enjoy it and you'll learn something from it. But a lot of jobs are kind of boring and miserable. You just have to do them for the money. So you only got that one-third left, and that's your actual life. And even a lot of that, almost half of it probably is family obligations, things like commuting, basic maintenance, doing your laundry, you're eating your meals. So there's not a lot of time. You almost got one-sixth of your life is where you're free to do what you want. And then you have to pick what you want to do. Um, and at this point in my life, I picked to teach nutrition and health and all this other stuff to the public and to write books about it. Because I sort of feel like that's my destiny. That's my purpose. It's sort of like all my boring, lonely, scholarly life led up to that. Um, so that's why I'll do that, even though I don't make any money. But I get paid really well in conventional medicine. Um, so it is what it is. Okay. And then here I, I joke about what's the difference between um, a vegan clinic or soteria. Well, I wanted to show you soteria. I think I got soteria coming up in a moment here. I know I, I, know I had a slide of it. Soteria means deliverance in Greek. So I've joked about this before. A little vegan clinic could be the most rinky-dink little place with no equipment, just you know, one nutrition expert who sits there and, and teaches the, the patients. And it will have hundreds of times more cures than the biggest fancy university hospital with all the bells and whistles, all the fancy new CAT scanners, MRIs, colonoscopies, laboratory tests, all that stuff. Because most patients are sick. They all got the same thing. They're all fat hypertensive, diabetic, and that leads to coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis in the brain, atherosclerosis in their ears, their eyes, in their Johnson, okay? And atherosclerosis causing tissue ischemia, lack of oxygen, causes cancer, okay? That's the main reason. There's more to cancer than that, but that's the metabolic theory of cancer, the Otto Warburg theory of cancer. He's a German biochemist who won Nobel Prize in 1931. Okay, so now we're going to talk about soteria. So you, you get my point. And I've also given the Thomas Wolf quote, uh, Wolf quote enough times. Modern buildings look like animal cages and there's a statue of a turd in front. Okay, that does not inspire confidence, a statue of a turd. It's like insult. Okay, um, now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you this guy here. This is uh, Peter Gotchke. And Peter Gotchke is a real smart guy. He was from the Cochrane Clinic and... Um, he wrote that uh, Deadly Psychiatry and Organized Denial. He basically, like I said, after his extensive study of psychiatry, came to the conclusion it kills far more people than it helps. It's a disaster, and it really is. People just don't know how bad it is because nobody tends to look closely into it. And he's the one who said all psychi we'd be better off if the world did not have any psychiatric drugs, and I would agree with that uh, based on a lot of knowledge of the field. Okay, here's a typical interesting research story in psychiatry. So soteria means uh, deliver, deliverance in Greek. And this guy, Lauren Mosher, was like the head psychiatrist in the whole United States. He was the head of the National Institute of Psychiatric Mental Health. And he had this idea that schizophrenics do better in a residential, family-like environment than they do taking all these pills. So he set up some residential homes. I think it was in California. And where the people, the counselors, they were interested in, you know, helping psychi psychiatric psychology patients, but they didn't really have that much training. And they mostly provided, like, social support. Um, and so he had all these uh, schizophrenics living in these houses. And the funny thing was the schizophrenic patients that lived in these houses did much, much better than the ones who were treated with drugs. Okay. This experiment went on between 1971 and 1983, Soteria. There's videos on this, too. You can look them up. I think I made a video about it as well. And they just kept, it kept them in touch with the real world. They were just given social support. 
And the schizophrenic patients made incredible recoveries. Over 85% of them had relatively good outcomes, like they were able to return to work, live in the real world, get married, have their own families. Um, in the cohort of schizophrenic patients that were treated primarily with drugs, very few were able to return to working and living in the real world. Only about 5 to 20%. Okay. And so you say, well, this is a miracle. Lauren Morsher has the best results of any doctor in the world for treating schizophrenia. He should win a Nobel Prize. He should become world famous. There should be you know, a parade for him down Main Street in every city. This is wonderful. So what happened to Nobel Morsher? They fired him. They said, you are biased against drugs, and they fired him. Okay, so <laughs> that's the reality of medicine. You go out of your way, the guy has the best results of any doctor, and they fire him. They hate his guts. He's going to lose money for them. And that's kind of one thing I'm trying to teach you guys is when you understand how the system works, you'll put a lot more effort into helping yourself and worrying less about what the system could do for you. Because it's good in a couple situations. You know, it's good in trauma. It's good with acute problems. It's good with some chronic end-stage things. You know, kidney transplant, put a patient on dialysis and all that. But for most of the common stuff people have, it really doesn't do much. And here's just another book I want to show you. This is Grace Jackson. She's also a psychiatrist. She's real smart. She went through all the literature uh, studying the effects of psychiatric drugs on the brain. And she came to the conclusion, basically, these are killing patients, giving them lobotomies, and their psychiatric drugs are a disaster. She calls it drug-induced dementia. It's a perfect crime because it never gets traced back to the psychiatrist, and they just destroy these people's brains. Like, think about it, too, when you hear about all the crap happening in the schools. How often do you actually hear any, you know, midstream uh, site, you know, talking about SSRIs uh, as being the, the main reason? Uh, you don't hear that. Okay, um, I think we're going to start getting into some more complex neurophysiology, and I think we're going to leave that for, that'll be lecture 17C. So this lecture today was 17B with a focus on psychiatry and psychology. Um, and the main conclusions were psychiatric drugs cause brain damage, electroshock causes brain damage, and that the psychology of Christianity is much better than the psychology of psychology. Um, so anyways, hope that was helpful. Hope that was interesting. <laughs>